I just got done building this incredible strategy game and I did it with Vibe Coding. I didn't write a single line of code, so I'm gonna show you exactly how I did it. The only real instructions that I gave was that I wanted a 2D grid-based, turn-based sci-fi strategy game. And initially I went to Grok and I just asked it to come up with the concept and the rules and to give me some general guidance. And from there, within just a few hours, I had a fully working game with resource management, strategy, different ships, a battle system, a building system, and artificial intelligence to play against. It is pretty incredible. So after I got the initial concept, I went to Cursor with Claude 3.7 thinking. First, I started with a very simple concept. I wanted a 10 by 10 grid game that is turn-based, it's sci-fi, and Grok came up with the name Nebula Dominion. So I then pasted the concept into Cursor and said, build me the framework. So it set up the basics in main.py, and then it started using some basic dependencies like Pygame and NumPy. It created an images and sounds folder, and then also created a readme where it put all the rules and the basic mechanics of the game. And then I ran it, but of course I ran into an issue immediately. I had some no module available issues, which are very common, just means I needed to install it. So of course, Cursor plus Claude 3.7 thinking, figured it out instantly, installed it, it, and then we were off to the races. So we added a game directory and a game state.py file to handle the game state. I accepted all the changes, didn't look at the code at all, ran it and just saw what happened. And there we go. I had a 10 by 10 blank grid staring back at me. It was ready. Now it was time to actually give some life to this 10 by 10 grid. I then had cursor and Claude 3.7 thinking, check the readme file, understand the concept of the game, understand the mechanics, and start to build out what needed to be there. So the initial pieces were four different ships. We had a Corvette, Mech, Dreadnought, and Drone. The Corvette was a fast scout, Mech was for ground combat, Dreadnought was the heavy hitter, and the Drone was for getting resources out of a planet. So I started to click around, figured out what worked. It really already had a bunch of functionality, like the hit points for each unit, how far they can move, but there were still a lot of issues and it really wasn't a complete game. And I needed to be able to test it, and I didn't have a second player readily available, so I just said, build me AI that I can play against. And I couldn't really tell what each unit was, so I had cursor label each unit so it's just much more clear. And so now when I made a move, I finished my turn, the AI then made their moves. One thing I really needed were some tool tips. I needed to be able to see the status of a unit, so how many hit points it has, how far it can move, what type of unit it is, everything. So I added tool tips on hover, and that was a big improvement. And it also gave me some information about what each unit should be doing, so drones go to a planet and gather nebula. But the movement of each unit was still very clunky. It just didn't feel very polished. For example, if you click one unit and then you go to click another unit, you first had to deselect the first unit before clicking the second unit. It just didn't make any sense. So I really polished that aspect up. When you select one unit and then you select another, it just automatically deselected the original unit. And then I wanted to make it clear when a unit was out of moves, so I graded out after moving to its maximum number of moves. And so then I tested it out, and another issue I saw was that I couldn't really tell what the AI was doing. The AI's turn would just happen instantly, and I really wanted to understand step by step what was happening. So I actually had it slow it down and then move each piece one by one so I can see what was going on along the way. And so at that point it felt pretty good, but I needed a battle system. There was none. When I went to attack another unit, nothing really happened. So I added a combat system. If two enemy pieces are adjacent, they can attack each other. The logic was still very, very simple. You had a number of hits and you had a health score and every single hit just reduced it in that exact amount. So not very sophisticated at all. And I also wanted to see a preview of the combat. So when you click a unit, you can kind of get a sense of, are you gonna do well in this battle or not? And it should feel pretty familiar to other turn-based strategy games. So I had one of my units attack their drone and voila, 100 down to 70 health. 
Thanks to the sponsor of this segment, Langtrace. They have been awesome partners to us, so excited to tell you about them again today. Langtrace is a leading AI software development consulting company that builds AI products to propel your business forward. Those products include an open source and open telemetry based observability and evaluations platform that helps you evaluate and improve your LLM usage in your application. It's trusted by thousands of developers from early stage companies all the way up to Fortune 500 companies. Langtrace helps developers collect and analyze traces, collect data sets, and run evaluations, resulting in highly reliable and secure AI systems. Again, Langtrace is open source and open telemetry and plugs in easily with OpenAI, Mistral, DeepSeek, Gemini, Weviate, Pinecone, and more. Langtrace offers end-to-end -end observability, tracing everything from LLMs to vector databases, and framework-level calls like Crew AI, Llama Index, DSPy, and Langchain. With native support for Crew AI, which you know I love, Langtrace provides a custom-built dashboard to track crew AI sessions, agents, tasks, tools, and memory. Track everything your agents are doing. So go from shiny demos to reliable AI products easily with Langtrace. Check out Langtrace. It is open source. And if you want to use their hosted version, you can get 20% off right now if you use the link in my description. And if you want to learn more, join one of their coming webinars where they go over everything. So check them out. They've been a great partner. Go star their GitHub. And thanks again to Langtrace. Now back to the video. And so there were kind of two things I wanted to focus on next. One were warp lanes and the other was kind of how the UI worked. And so the warp lanes, when I was testing them, I expected different warp lanes on the map. And if you're on one warp lane, you can warp to any other square that is also a warp lane, but it wasn't really working like that. So I literally just said, this is how I want the warp lanes to work. And it fixed it and it worked really well. I also said, make sure warp lanes spawn at least one tile apart. And I added some move range visuals. So when you click on a unit, you can see how far it can move and where it can move to. But we still couldn't attack bases. And there really wasn't this notion of bases yet. And the command center, the base, I kind of used those terms interchangeably, which actually ended up biting me in the butt later. And I had to clean that up. And let me actually pause for a second. One thing that I would highly recommend as you're doing this, and I've learned a lot about vibe coding going through this, and I'm building a few other projects, have a really clear spec. And you can use AI to help you write the spec. But if you're using different terminology like base versus command center, it's going to reflect in the code and you're going to have issues because a base and a command center are two very different things in the actual code. And so I really wanted to make bases a critical part of the game. That's what I focused on next. First of all, I made bases and I made them attackable. And so now I have my first win condition, which is if you destroy the enemy base, you win. So there's this notion of, OK, let's go explore, but also Let's make sure we don't go too far out because then we're going to leave our base vulnerable and it can be attacked and we lose. So I started to build out a build menu next. I wanted to be able to build different units. And initially when you built something, the unit would appear immediately, but I thought a one turn waiting period would be cool. So you select a unit you want to build and then on the next turn, that unit actually shows up and is usable. And of course, each ship type costs different nebula. So really trying to make the game economy dynamic. So drones were less, dreadnoughts were more, etc. At this point, I'm realizing the very basic visuals that are just squares and triangles and shapes like that were not going to be sufficient. And I started adding visuals using sprites, but I ended up doing this off camera. So I'll just explain what I did. I just went to a free sprite downloading website and there are a bunch of free visuals that you can download. So sprites are just like 2D animations or 2D graphics that you could use in games. Literally, this is the coolest part. I downloaded the folder of all the assets. I put the folder in my game folder and told Cursor, go look in that folder, figure out based on the name of each file, which one would be appropriate for each unit, planet, square, etc., and just assign them. And it did, and it was really impressive. There were a couple where it didn't make sense and I just fixed it by explaining what I wanted instead. And it was starting to come together and look pretty darn good. And so now ships had graphics, planets had graphics, the background tiles had graphics, it was nice. And then I started testing it, there were a bunch of issues and so I started fixing them. So for example, sometimes the wind condition would be triggered immediately after the first turn and literally just describe these issues, let cursor fix it and we were off to the races. I tweaked the 
the affordability logic with Nebula. I tweaked some of the range, some of the hit points, etc. And it started to feel like an actual really nice balanced game. I also wanted a way to test the win conditions without having to play through the entire game every time. So I added a little bit of debugging where I can trigger the base to get destroyed for each player or all of the units to be destroyed for each player. And initially it was with key commands and I ended up making that kind of a hidden menu instead. And so I tested out the win conditions and it worked great. And then I refactored a lot of it. I did that off camera. I literally said cursor refactor it and it did. So I had movement battles, building, win conditions, an entire story behind it. It was actually a pretty cool game. And I learned a lot. I would say in total, I probably spent four hours building this. And the majority of that time was simply waiting for cursor to finish. And I was actually able to do that in the background while doing other things. So I'd write a command, let it go off. It would go off for a few minutes to up to 10 minutes at certain times. And then I would come back and look and just continue it. So it was almost asynchronous coding. Now I've built other projects since this one and I've learned a lot. So a couple tips to leave you with. Number one, commit along the way. Because what I noticed is I would change one thing and I would notice three other things would break or change in ways that I didn't expect. So make sure you're using Git. Make sure you're committing often. Every time you get a working state of the game, go ahead and commit it. And so you have this save point. And by the way, Cursor can do that for you. You just say commit the code and push it to GitHub. And then another one, write tests along the way. So once you get the game to a good state, tell Cursor to write tests for you, integration tests, unit tests, whatever you want. I think integration tests are probably the most appropriate and just let it test it for you. Make sure the tests pass. And then every time, here is my workflow. I make changes, test them manually, make sure they work, ask Cursor to write tests for them, get all the tests to pass, and if they do, then I commit and push the code and start on my next feature. And so that is my workflow for this game. That's my workflow for other cool stuff that I'm building. And yeah, I've just been completely enamored with Vibe coding. I am really enjoying coding. I haven't coded this much in a while. I don't even consider this coding. It feels like cheating almost. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm happy to make more Vibe coding videos in the future. Just let me know in the comments down below. If you did enjoy this video, please consider giving a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.